think you might have a story in your head about how the First World War began, and it's probably wrong, or at the very least incomplete. It probably begins and ends with the assassination of an Austrian archduke, but that is far, far, far from the whole story. And the real story has a lot more to do with the German decision to build a bunch of battleships called dreadnoughts. Those dreadnoughts still exist today, except they're not in Germany and they're not floating anymore. They're actually in Scotland, about 130 feet below the surface. And if you're wondering to yourself, uh, well, how the heck did a bunch of battleships start a war? And what the heck are they doing in the middle of nowhere, Scotland? Well, then I think this is the right channel for you. So stick around. We're going to investigate those questions in this next episode of Submerged Stories. Okay, so, yes, I'm not trying to deny that the assassination of Franz Ferdinand took place, right? It obviously happened, and it triggered a whole set of alliances. But to me, the more interesting question is, why did those alliances even exist in the first place? And I think we're just, we're so used to World War II, because we see it in TV and movies all the time. We just assume that Germany is always the uh, bad guys, quote-unquote, and that, you know, Britain and France fight together against Germany, and that's just the way things are. But it's not especially if we were to look leading up to World War II and say, who is Britain's kind of natural arch rival? The answer is pretty clearly the French. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. I mean, it doesn't take much. Go back to the Napoleonic Wars, and that was Britain against France. And they actually, at Waterloo, when they defeated Napoleon, the British were fighting alongside the Prussians, and the Prussians are just Germans, right? Let's not forget the British burned Joan of Arc at the stake, they were fought for hundreds of years. And, and oh yeah, another example, just again from the Napoleonic Wars this time, Napoleon invaded Russia and burnt Moscow to the ground. Uh, that was just, just about 100 years before World War I. That's not something you forget that easily. And yet, in that time frame, the alliances flipped and it became Britain, Russia, and France against Germany and Austria. So the real question in my mind, the real why of World War I, is what caused those alliances to flip and what caused the alliances to form the way they did. And I think we can really start to answer that question and get at the why of World War I by examining ships like this one, the SMS Crown Prince. The Crown Prince is such a good example of the switch from explaining history to actually seeing up close because, well, her shipwreck still exists today in Scapa Flow. And I actually traveled all the way to the north of Scotland to dive this shipwreck. So here we are. Right now we're about 125 feet underwater. The temperature is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so quite chilly. We're in dry suits and we're making our way to the shipwreck. Keep in mind the Crown Prince is a German dreadnought and that makes for really an incredible wreck site. The ship is 580 feet long and weighs 26,000 tons. And here we are at the main attraction of the whole thing, which are her massive forward turrets. So how exactly did the Germans come to build so many dreadnoughts like this one, which were such a threat to the British Royal Navy? Well, we're going to come back, we're going to do some more diving, don't worry. But let's just jump back into the history for a second to explain exactly what happened. By the late 19th century, the British Empire spans the world. This is the time when the sun never sets on the British Empire. And around this time, Parliament passes an act. It's called the Two Power Standard, and it requires the Royal Navy to be as large as the next two largest navies in the world combined. At the time this law was passed, it was the French and the Russians that were the next two largest navies. But by the early 1900s, the second largest navy in the world was Germany. Now, this is weird and a break from tradition because Germany has traditionally been a land power. So what caused Germany to pursue this rather odd path of building a navy? Well, the answer is that the Kaiser thought battleships were cool. I mean, <laughs> I'm exaggerating like just a little bit, guys. There were obviously a lot more complex reasons for it than that, but also I'm not exaggerating all that much. We have to remember that the Kaiser is a relative 
of the British royal family. He's cousins with them. He grew up around the royal family. He grew up with great respect for the royal navy. And as a result, he thinks battleships are cool and he wants some of his own. In his memoirs, he's pretty explicit. When I was a little boy, I was allowed to visit Portsmouth and Plymouth hand in hand with kind aunts and friendly admirals. I admired the proud English ships in those two superb harbors. Then and there awoke in me the wish to build ships of my own like these someday, and when I was grown up to possess as fine a navy as the English. He either didn't know, or didn't care, or both, but didn't care what this would mean for British public sentiment. But of course, it was seen as a challenge and turned British public sentiment previously favorable to Germans against them, and caused the British to look to France as an ally, and ultimately to sign what's called the Entente Cordiale, where the British aligned themselves with the French against the Germans because of this naval arms race. By 1904, tensions between the British and the Germans are rising, but we can make no mistake about who has naval supremacy. The British have 50 battleships, the Germans have 23, the French 17, and the Russians 16. In other words, the British have more than twice as many battleships as the Germans, and they have 10 more ships than is strictly required by the two power standard. So British naval supremacy is all but assured. And then just two years later though, something huge happens. There is a naval revolution that in a snap turns the world upside down. Let's head back to Scuba and the shipwreck. This is a map of the site so you know where we are. We're gonna leave those main turrets and go forward until we hit some smaller but still impressive gun turrets. Then we're gonna come out from underneath the shipwreck, swim up to the top of the site, which is the bottom of the boat, she's upside down, then head further aft over some debris fields and over the rest of the ship and end at the ship's main rudders, which are pretty huge and pretty impressive. So what exactly was this revolution that upended the balance of naval power? Well, it was this idea of an all big gun battleship. The idea is, well, we'll just strip down the smaller medium guns and we'll leave only the big long range ones. And ships are getting faster too. And so if you have a fast ship with big guns, you can outrange your enemy, engage them at distance. They won't even get in close. You'll have accurate fire and you can sink the enemy. It's a pretty powerful concept. And if it worked, it would probably make obsolete every single existing battleship. But at the time, in 1905, these big gun battleships are just theoretical. And the guy in charge of the Royal Navy at the time is a guy by the name of Jackie Fisher. And so he faces a dilemma. And it's actually a shockingly modern dilemma. Does he choose to self-disrupt or not? Curious, what, what would you choose? The challenge facing Jackie Fisher is as the largest Navy in the world, he has the most to lose from effectively obsolete in every single battleship in the world. This problem still pops up in corporate boardrooms to this day. Take Facebook, for example. They were challenged by a new product, Snapchat, that was disrupted in the market. They pursued what's called a fast follower strategy where they see the disruption and they very quickly implement a version of their own. In this case, it was Instagram stories, very successful. Some people may choose to not try and cannibalize their own products and to sit tight on what is working for them now. That was certainly an option for Jackie Fisher. Of course, the counter example of that is what happened to say Kodak, which was faced with disruption in the form of digital photography. And we all know how that story ended. So you've had some time to think it over. What path would you choose? Ultimately, Jackie Fisher chose the path of self-disruption. The British lead was erased from 27 ships to just a single ship, the HMS Dreadnought. The Germans saw their golden opportunity. They would never get a chance like this again to catch British at naval parity, and so they started building Dreadnoughts at an incredible rate. It was this, of course, that escalated tensions to a really even higher level, and this set the powder keg that ultimately led to, at the time, the deadliest conflict in human history. And so the assassination in Sarajevo was just the spark, but I view it more like a game of, um, like a game of dominoes, right? The hard work 
that takes time is laying all those little domino pieces and that's what the naval arms race was and then ultimately just knocking over a single piece that's the easy part and in my mind kind of the least interesting part to be honest with you see i think this is the problem with how a lot of history is taught when your teacher tells you that a 19 year old kid killed a prince and that started a war it makes it very hard to relate to the people of the past they seem backwards archaic outdated but if the real cause of world war one wasn't that assassination if the real cause was technological disruption leading to an arms race fueled by ego-driven leaders who signed unstable alliances well <laughs> all of a sudden that's not so foreign, that's not so outdated. In fact, it's almost scarily modern. To me, that's what the steel wreckage that we're looking at on the bottom of the seafloor represents. It's a tangible link between us and the people of the past, and it helps give us lessons about our world today. Today, there is just a single dreadnought afloat. It's the museum ship, the USS Texas. And actually, as I record this, that museum is closed to the public. That means the only place in the world where you can see one of these dreadnoughts is by diving one of her wrecks. I, that to me is pretty powerful. It's a really incredible privilege that comes with travel and with scuba diving and with wreck diving in particular. We can go down there and actually touch the history that led to these conflicts and the history that represents these really powerful dilemmas and really relevant dilemmas. It teaches us that history is not just these things in these textbooks, that there are things that we can learn from history that still apply today. These talks about these geopolitical arms races, great power conflicts, corporate strategy, self-disruption. These are not historical discussions. These are modern discussions and we have things that we can learn from our past to inform the decisions we make today. And so when we go wreck dive, and it's true, we can't raise the ships from the bottom of the sea, but I do think that maybe we can bring those submerged stories to the surface. Oh, I was supposed to tell you how a German fleet wound up in Scotland, wasn't I? Well, it's a really cool story, but I guess it'll have to wait for part two.